Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Imhenna. I'm the moderator for today's talk. Our special guest is Daniel T. Potts, who received his AB and PhD in anthropology from Harvard, specializing in Near Eastern archaeology. His main areas of interest are Iran, Mesopotamia, and the Persian Gulf. And as a field of archaeologist, he has conducted excavations in Iran and Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates. He's a founding editor in chief of the Arabian Archaeology and, uh, and Epi uh, Epigraphy. He's a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute and ISMEO. Dan, welcome to Africa. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. <clears throat> so, you know, when I think of archaeology, I think of, um, you know, a sort of Indiana Jones type character. Um, and especially archaeology in this type of um, in this region, I'm curious. What does archaeology mean in 2022? What does that actually mean um, for somebody who's in the field? Well, I suppose you know the the Indiana Jones part is is usually associated with the excavation. Um, and a kind of <clears throat> adventure, you could say. And there's, you know, there's still plenty of excavation that goes on. But I think the difference from even, you know, 50 years ago or 40 years ago is that there's a, a much more um, attention paid to the analysis of the finds, particularly scientific analysis. And so, you, the, the interpretation, first the analysis, and then the interpretation is every bit as important as the excavation. So the excavation is, is you know, I it's a kind of the tip of the iceberg, really. And, um, you know, there, there are people who love excavation and aren't particularly of a scholarly bent, uh, on, would rather have the fun and sort of excitement of discovering new things, um, being in foreign places, <clears throat> but they don't have the scholarly interest necessarily to put the new material, new discoveries together in a synthetic way and really interpret it and, and show what its meaning is. Uh, and then there are other people who are, you know, um, you've probably all heard the term armchair archaeologists who really kind of look at what has been published by other people or what's in museums, and maybe write a lot about things uh, without doing a lot of fieldwork themselves. So there's a kind of a spectrum of, of what of personalities, yeah. you could say, uh, who who get involved in archaeology. Yeah. What are? Let me ask you a question. What is at stake for your the work that you're doing? Um, what is, from your perspective, what are the stakes? Well, you know, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think for me, yeah. um, human history uh, and what we've done before, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly are just as important as what's going on today. <clears throat> and that's not in, at all to diminish what's going on today, but I think it is very um, it is very important as a species that we have some understanding of what our forebears have done, the mistakes they've made, the developments they've made, their achievements, um, and that we put our own lives into a the perspective of a, of a larger sort of stream of of history. Yeah. So for me. You know, I'm not a physicist, I'm not terribly mechanical, but I like historical uh, questions and I think I can contribute to uh, a better understanding of, of the past. And then it just so happens through exposure as a student that I got very interested in the Middle East it could have been somewhere else, you know, potentially, uh, but I had a very strong uh, interest in history from really from primary school. And then I had an exposure in the Middle East and 
that's where I've sort of stayed all my career. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to go back to the sort of 70s and 80s and talk about your interests. I, I, I kind of want to ask you a, a question. It's, um, it's in the news now. I, I don't know if it's playing as much in the U.S. as it is in the Arab world, but there's all these um, clips of news reporters who are talking about what's happening in U Ukraine, and they're saying, you know, this is happening in a civilized country, right? It's not like it's happening in Iraq or it's happening in yeah. Afghanistan, right? The, uh, the insinuation that those are uncivilized places. <laughs> well, um, and the retort that's happening on social media is, well, what a asinine thing to say. This is obviously there aren't places that are uncivilized to begin with, and and even further, the the satire is dripping off the page because this is a, a the part of the region, the part of the world that they're talking about is a region that's described as the cradle of civilization. Um, so my question to you is: Is that a scientific term? Do do anthropologists and people who think about ancient history who look at Mesopotamia sort of roll their eyes when people say this is the cradle of civilization? Mm, uh, look, y yes and no. I mean, it, it's, a, it's hyperbole for sure. But I think the people who might kind of defend it would be thinking that uh, this is where uh, agriculture was developed earlier than, than elsewhere. It's not to say that, you know, it didn't spread quickly or that, you know, every area is interesting. You know, the minute you start to delve into it, it's all interesting. I don't, I don't think the, the Middle East is necessarily more interesting than any place else. And I don't, I don't particularly, you know, th this idea of the cradle of civilization is also problematic because you know, whose civilization, right? I mean, in, in, in the Enlightenment uh, and Renaissance and early modern period in Europe, people were very happy to look at the Greeks and Romans as, as the sort of origin of civilization. That kind of changed in the 19th century um, at when biblical scholarship kind of joined together with early explorations in Mesopotamia. And then suddenly, oh, the Middle East is our heritage. Well, you know, you, you, uh, it's, it's, it, I don't think that's a terribly uh, useful way of, of looking at the past. That's, that's certainly not the reason I study it. There may be people who, I'm sure there are people who, who feel that somehow uh, even if they're not, even if their families weren't from the Middle East, but they somehow feel that it is their heritage. I don't feel it's my heritage. I just find it incredibly interesting. And, and in a way, I think it's, it's probably better that I don't have a kind of emotional attachment to, you know, in the sense that these are my ancestors. I think it gives me a bit more objectivity when I'm, I'm studying things. But anyway, of course, you're gonna run across these terms like the cradle of civilization or the fertile crescent. People have been using these sorts of terms for a very long time. But you know, at the end of the day, they don't actually impart much wisdom. Sure. Um, okay, so I wanna ask you, as I was reading uh, about your work and as I was listening to a bunch of stuff that you've been doing, I realized that, you know, there are many different pasts, obviously. And when you look at, when you look at a map like this, uh, this isn't a map, but when you look at an image like this, I fill in the gaps. I, my eye starts drawing dotted lines and starts layering text. <laughs> onto it automatically. And they're very much 20th century, 21st century um, information being layered onto it. So I'm asking you, when you look at this image, what are the things that you sort of fill in the gaps with naturally? Yeah, I, 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 my, my mind sort of flashes with uh, thoughts of these, this large area. I mean, I'm focusing now on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, 
Mesopotamia, the Iranian plateau, and the sort of adjacent bits that I have worked on. And, you know, without even thinking about it, I instinctively or, or subconsciously, I'm thinking about how it was at 3000 BC or 2000 BC, or even, you know, 1800 AD, um, I, I have a definitely a, a kind of a chronological way of, of, of ordering things. And, and also within that uh, line, I have a, a sense of the very different um, regional boundaries or uh, borders that existed as states and empires changed through time. So areas that were once under one empire and now are culturally a very different sort of situation. I, I, I think of those things when I look at this. And I, yeah. I like the fact that there are no uh, boundaries on this. I mean, this is a like satellite image of the world, but I like the fact that you can look at the area without the boundaries because the boundaries are, and I'm, I'm constantly telling my students this, the boundaries are not helpful when it comes to understanding the history of this area. It's not to say that there weren't boundaries. It's just there were, there were often boundaries once states began to expand and grow, but um, they just aren't where they are today. And therefore, you know, in every situation, whether you're working in Lebanon or you're working in Armenia, there's going to be a, a national boundary between Lebanon and Syria, which has absolutely no meaning for the archaeology of the greater region at a given point in time. Uh, and, you know, this means it's very important not to get stuck on the national literature of, of, of a topic, which is very easy to do also because of languages. So you might work on, I might work on something that's, you know, kind of based in Northwestern Iran or let's say, or Northern Iraq. And just, you know, a few kilometers further North, there's related material, related sites, but uh-oh, suddenly, there's a national boundary and the, lang the, the language of the archeological publications from the other side may be Russian or may be Armenian, you know, and, or maybe Turkish. And then uh, you, that sort of leads to people putting down the blinkers and saying, right, well, I'm just gonna deal with this area, which is an area that I can kind of wrap my head around and in which I can read the literature. But yeah. uh, that's that's totally artificial. That's a completely artificial product of 19th, 20th century bound, uh, national borders. So this is getting to a point that I wanted to talk about later, but maybe I'll talk about this now because as a we as a current day quest to understand uh, you know history um, bumps up against current day political agendas. How do you maneuver those things? Uh, how do you as a scholar maneuver the natural desire to co-opt um, uh, co sort of historical narratives to reinforce uh, modern day contemporary borders and contemporary sort of national agendas? Yeah, well, I, that's, I, I think there's a big difference uh, and this is why I, I said before that I hope I have a certain degree of objectivity, even though objectivity is a very, you know, yeah. relative, uh, relative concept. But I, I think, you know, as I am not uh, from any of the countries that I, I've worked on, uh, and these borders don't mean really a, a lot to me, except, you know, in real practical terms, they may hinder me if I'm trying to do something. But I think as far as understanding what was going on, um, it's very important not to get hung up on them. And it's also very important not to allow, I mean, you know, there's a limit to which we can influence 
current political dialogue, but to the extent that we can give some sort of truths to historical reconstruction, we can push back against conceptions that are utterly anachronistic. You know, yeah. I mean, there, there are, um, for example, you know, there, there are scholars who have suggested Turkish etymologies for names that are within, uh, that, that appear, let's say, in cuneiform sources uh, from Eastern Turkey, Armenia, Western Iran, where we had a kingdom in the Iron Age known as Urartu, right? Well, there were no Turkic speakers within, you know, 3,000 miles, right? But for modern political advantages, it people have cynically used uh, distorted ancient evidence uh, to say, oh, no, 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 this is Turkish. We will we were always here. Well, no, sorry, you weren't always there. You were once upon a time on the borders of Western China uh, in inner Asia, and you migrated and the Seljuks came into Iran and the Seljuks kept on going into Turkey, right? So, you know, I'm not, I have no dog in the fight. You know, it's not, I couldn't care less. All I care about actually is the historical accuracy and if yeah. somebody could tell me, show me that, yes, this group was there, fine, fine. But, sure. you know, if the evidence doesn't show that, then I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in pursuing a false narrative like that. Let me ask you a question. And this may sound like a strange question to ask, but do we know more about the past today than we did 200 years ago or 300 years ago? Oh, yeah. Oh, and how? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, it's a combination of the fact that, you know, two, two or 300 years ago, um, by, 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 say, by 1700 uh, or 1800, almost all of the literary Greek and Latin sources that uh, we know today uh, were known. Right. So they knew a lot, but of course they didn't have the archaeology and they didn't have the epigraphic side. They didn't have the inscriptions that have been found or the cuneiform tablets that have been found subsequent to the mid 19th century as excavations really sort of took off. So, you know, there's no question that we know far, far more. But what is interesting, though, is that I mean, there are many things that are interesting that um, when I look at the, these maps, mm -hmm. particularly the, 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 um, the one which is based on Ptolemy's map there on the left, yeah. um, the scholars of the Enlightenment or the, even the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, but certainly in the Enlightenment and the early modern period, were really tireless about scouring every single source they could. And so there are, there are studies of the Persian Gulf, for example, written in the 18th century that not only use every classical source available, but they use Turkish and Arabic and Persian historians, which were already, the manuscripts were already being published and studied, and they use the reports of East India Company um, sailors, ships captains. So they were really assiduous in gathering all the data they could. But as I say, there was no archeological evidence and, and really no exploration, not much exploration yet. There's some exploration of archeological sites, but nothing compared to what happened in the more recent, in the past, 200 or 150 years. Interesting. Um, because the reason why I asked that question is because as I was reading about your work, um, I saw this list of names. Yeah. <laughs> and I almost didn't recognize any yeah. of them. I mean, East India Company, um, yeah. 
Kawasim, Safa, yeah. uh, Safavids, Portuguese, obviously. But the reason why it, it struck me is because I feel like when I think about the um, the Arabian and Persian Gulf, if I think about what is now, um, you know, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Oman, yeah. when I think about the history of this place as somebody who's largely yeah. uninformed, um, I think about sort of Oman, the British, <laughs> the Omani Empire, yeah. the British Empire, the Trucial States, and then entering into contemporary life. Yeah. But I don't know anything before that. Yeah. No, I think that's 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 quite common, you know. Uh, and unfortunately, I think it's been, I mean, partly it's the languages, you know. They're not, it, it's not, it hasn't been that easy uh, for non-specialists to access uh you know sources on buyid history right the 10th yeah. century dynasty uh in iran that actually controlled parts of oman and and uh are in and around the uh the gulf or even portuguese sources so if i can ask you yeah i know there's a very hard question to ask yeah. but I'm going to prompt you, and I want to see if you can help us understand, fill in the gaps beforehand. So there are these yeah. four groups. There's the Arabians, the Persians, the Portuguese, the Omanis, right? That are all sort of stomping around. <laughs> yeah, but only after 1500, right? So there's a whole lot going on before 1500. Okay, so yeah, help, yeah. help me understand. Yeah. Walk me so, through the before. Yeah, <laughs> so the, um, I mean, with the, you know, to... Uh, it depends where you want to start, right? But, but uh, yeah, if we uh, the obviously the the whole you know the whole kind of age of exploration that involved the Portuguese navigators and sailing around the Cape of Good Hope that only really gets going in the in the later fifteenth century, um, and you know we have the 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 voyages of Columbus to the New World and so forth. Um, and so the, in, the, the Portuguese entry into the Indian Ocean is also after mm -hmm. that late 15th century. And the Portuguese start out in India, but they quickly, Alfonso de Albuquerque goes to um, Southern Iran and comes into the Persian Gulf, where there is a very lucrative, a very rich and very successful kingdom of Hormuz, uh, which is based on the island of Hormuz. It had been previously based on the mainland, but for strategic and defensive reasons, they moved to the island of Hormuz. Um, What's happening they, before then? Before Yeah, so before then, there, yeah. there are other, if we go back to that map, there are other um, small you won't, wouldn't even call them states, but along the southern coast of, of Iran, um, there's a kingdom. Uh, there are a couple of kingdoms. There's one based uh, on the island of Kish, which is, again, a very small place. Um, not that many people, but it was a maritime, uh, a maritime kingdom that preceded the kingdom of Hormuz. Before that, further up the coast, is the site of Siraf. Siraf was a very important trading post, um, really, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it a city-state, but it was, it was kind of, in a way, probably independent, um, an independent port uh, in the Abbasid period. Um, and it had trade links all the way to China. Wow. And there's a, a merchant, um, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, but he was in, I guess, the 10th century or early 11th century, and he was considered by some people to be kind of the world's first millionaire. And they were trading not only to the east, to China, but they were trading down to Yemen and into the Red Sea to Egypt. Um, and and uh, the kingdom of Kish, this kingdom of Kish, which is on this small, was on a small island uh, off the coast of, of Iran in the in the Persian Gulf um, is mentioned in the source 
uh, known as the Cairo Geniza. The, these are documents from the uh, 12th and 11th century uh, of Jewish merchants in Cairo. And they, you know, they give, they, they show you what the world was, how interconnected it was literally from the Red Sea to China, East, Southeast Asia, the Persian Gulf. So there was a lot going on. And that's why the Portuguese were interested because there was a lot of lucrative commerce going on. They didn't really want territorial conquest and they remained pretty much uh, a maritime um, organization really in the East. Um, they had their base at Goa, um, but they were very content to extort and control trade. Um, so they knocked over the kingdom of Hormuz and it became tributary to them. And then the Ottomans after the conquest of Iraq, which was about, I think, 1541, they appear in the Persian Gulf. So there is a, there's a lot going on. And the Safavids are, are in mainland Iran and they're producing sil uh, silk and the, and the East India Company is, is established and is interested in purchasing Iranian silk. Um, so there, is, there was a whole lot going on. And sometimes things spill over onto the Arabian shores. Julfar, which is in modern day Ras al um, was a very important port uh, in, the in what is today the Northern Emirates. Um, and these places were all, and places on the coast of Oman um, were all involved in this. So there was a lot that was pre, you know, before the suppression of the pirates and the, 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 the Treaty of 1820 that created the Trucial uh, regime in the, in the Emirates and Bahrain and, and Qatar. There was a whole lot going on that's kind of medieval to early modern and is incredibly interesting. Um, and I, I just got interested in that because as an archeologist, I've, I have always found it difficult to sort of draw the line temporally. I get mm -hmm. interested in something and actually I really get interested in the region or the, the area I'm working in. And then I simply wanna know how things developed and changed over time. And then I, I'm moving beyond strictly archeological sources, obviously for, for this yeah. kind of thing. What is the connection to modern day Kuwait? Like the, the, the sort of Romani epicenter to the Kuwaiti part of the, of the, of the Gulf? I mean, is it, of, uh, let me ask this question differently. Is this of the same place historically? Or is there a different uh, center of gravity for for Kuwait as yeah? The, well, I, I would say that within the within this region, um, uh, if you're thinking of the yeah, maybe seventeenth, eighteenth, yeah. early nineteenth century, um, then definitely Basra is the the main place. At the, yeah. at the head of the Gulf. Um, uh, Kuwait or Bushir on the Iranian coast, they're not nearly as important. Um, the, right down at the Straits of Hormuz, um, Bandar Abbas was founded by Shah Abbas I. Um, and that became very important as a kind of uh, outlet uh, and a base for the Dutch and for the English East India companies. Um, but that ended uh, and in the 18th century, the English established a trading station at Bushir, modern uh, Bandar Bushir. Um, but Basra was much bigger, much, much more important. Bushir had the advantage that it's the sort of outlet if you wanna go up into Fars, say up to Shiraz, yeah. and then up to Isfahan. Uh, but in the earlier times, that was not used. The, there was an overland route from Isfahan to Bandar Abbas, and that that was that was more important. 
But Kuwait, yeah, Kuwait did not have the same importance. Um, and of course, you know, the pearl fishery of the, of the Persian Gulf, Kuwait, um, Qatar, Bahrain, that, mm -hmm. was, that was important and that was very lucrative. And there are periods uh, in which these places are more or less important and in which there's, there's a local dynasty and there really were local dynasties until the Wahhabis came along in, in Arabia. Uh, and and conquered that region. But before that, the coastal regions had been pretty well independent of any mainland power. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to ask next. Um, I want to understand the interaction between these coastal regions on the on the Persian Arabian Gulf side as and their connection to the Hejaz and the connection to yeah. sort of Basra and the rest and sort of Syria and yeah. What, I think, you know, it's uh, obviously the Raven Peninsula is a big place and really it, it um, interconnectivity, there was some interconnectivity in prehistory very close uh, to Mesopotamia along the, the Gulf Coast. But as far as broader interconnectivity, uh, it wasn't really possible until after about a thousand BC with the domestication of the camel. So the domestication of the camel then permits the caravans, the creation, you know, the, the sort of origin of caravans yeah. to travel from South Arabia, which has got, which is super rich because of the frankincense and myrrh to bring that up to, uh, up to Sinai, up to Gaza, but also across the peninsula uh, to towards southern Babylonia. Um, but really, I think, you know, the coastal regions developed quite differently, partly because they're, they can communicate better with the rest of the, of the, like the Iranian side of the Gulf or Mesopotamia or Oman, by sea, it's a lot easier to sail. And I have a, uh, at home, I've got this wonderful book, which is an early, uh, is, it's, I suppose it's from the early 20th century. I don't know what the earliest edition was, but it's called Reed's Tables of Distances. And it's a book that ship's captains would use. And it tells you the distance between just about every port in the world. Wow. Right. And so when you start to look at the places around the Gulf, Dubai to Kuwait, Kuwait to Bushir, Basra, you know, to Doha, you see this is it's nothing. It's a it's a 150, a couple of hundred um, miles. It's a lot easier than this than the hard slog across the Arabian Peninsula. So I just think that these areas by virtue of the desert behind them are sort of separated. Um, and that's very much the case with Oman, that Oman's orientation culturally, you know, is the Western Indian Ocean. And that's hence the development of the Omani empire in Zanzibar. So, you know, and there, I always remember 40 years ago, an archeologist who was working in Oman um, said to me, apropos links between the Harappan civilization of, of the Indus Valley in the third millennium BC and Oman and, and, the, and the Gulf region, he said, you know, nowadays, uh, a rich Omani goes to Mumbai. That's, that's what, you know, he's thinking, if I'm going to go somewhere, that's where I'll go. And it, it's, it's all part of the, that very old heritage of seafaring in the in the Indian Ocean. So their orientation is not to continental Arabia at all. It's not even that much to South Arabia, um, uh, Southwestern Arabia, Yemen. It's very much Indian Ocean oriented. Yeah. And then Yemen is very oriented also to the Red Sea, to yeah. the Horn of Africa. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's uh, to India, um, 
it's, you know, once you get down into this part of the world, which I've, you know, done a fair bit of work on, it, it's, it's different than the northern Middle East. It's really more oriented towards Asia and Africa, you could say. So I guess let me bring us back to today. Um, what do we stand to gain, you know, in 2022 um, as we as we develop a deeper understanding and a more sort of nuanced understanding of prehistory and sort of um, and uh, of the last 2000, 3000 years of the region. Um, what, do, you know, maybe saying it as crudely as possible, what's, what's the point of understanding this stuff on, a, on improving our, our, the way we live today and the way we live tomorrow? <laughs> well, I don't know if it can improve the way we live today, although, you know, it is very... By avoiding the mistakes of yesterday, maybe. Well, it's, it's certainly useful to, I mean, on, on some practical levels, it is absolutely useful to know about how, you know, people approach problems like irrigation. Um, that's not to say that the, that the engineers of today or the, the planners, uh, government planners, are particularly, uh, particularly care about that. But um, absolutely, the, the, you know, the environment, of course, with climate change, things are getting worse. I was gonna say things are more or less the same. They had been more or less the same for the last couple thousand years with you know, slight variations. And so, things like date palm cultivation or irrigation or fishing for that matter, all those sorts of industries. If, if you're wondering, you know, can it be done here? How would we need, what would we need to do it? If you can look back to the past and see whether it was done or, or how it was done uh, and learn something. But as I say, I don't think, you know, government planners are particularly studying what comes out of, of archaeological fieldwork. But, you know, it's, it, it's what I don't, I, I don't want to see is, is the discoveries being that we make being used for crude nationalist purposes. Um, and, you know, in some cases, there's a tendency towards that, not by archaeologists and historians, but by uh, people in political uh, positions um, as to whether, you know, who was here first, that sort of thing, you know, and, and I mean, we, in many respects, that, that's, that's a sort of fruitless line of inquiry. Although, you know, we can show in certain periods how boundaries or borders have changed. Yeah. And that's also useful um, to, keep in mind that you know if if one government says but this was always part of whatever russia ukraine this and that you know you can often say well actually no that was conquered in in you know this period and it, it wasn't always necessarily this way yeah. um but you know i i don't i don't have any delusions about the the use of of what I do in the modern world, I think you know partly it, it's good enough that a lot of people are interested in the human past, and that that is a that is a you know I think a good that's a that's a social good to be contributing yeah a better understanding to that. Well, I mean, personally, I would be I would be more bullish about the the impact <laughs> you know, because I do think that um, being short sighted when looking at the past results in a lot of blunders, and so having a broader understanding of a fuller understanding of the rear what we see in the rear view mirror is useful. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just um, that, you know, the, the modern, the modern view, I mean, just as you were saying before, the, uh, the view in the, in Eastern Arabia or the, or the Gulf region often hard, doesn't really go beyond, beyond 
the early 19th century British East India Company sort of involvement and arrival. Um, and yeah, there are, there are air, all over the place. There are, I, there are examples where, you know, people might wish to go to war over a, a boundary and say, well, it's always been this way. I mean, Afghanistan is a very good example. Um, Afghanistan is not an old country. Afghanistan really, uh, you know, becomes something of, of its own in the 18th century. So, you know, to some people that's old. To me, that's not so old. Um, and the same with, with, you know, the situation in the Caucasus. Um, the Russian presence in the Caucasus on, really only dates to the early 18th century when Peter the Great led an expedition, uh, probably because uh, Iran's, the, the Safavid uh, king was under terrific pressure and eventually was toppled uh, by an Afghan invasion. And it seemed like quite an opportune time to push the Russian border further to the south without a huge amount of resistance. Now that got pushed back as well. So, you know, there's nothing God given about the fact that Georgia or Armenia or Dagestan are eternally and always Russian, by no means, by no means. So there, there are cases like that or cases along the Iran-Iraq border, right? That border was really settled over time by negotiations and treaties dating back to the 16th century. And it has changed. Um, and so, you know, that's where I would always say one shouldn't jump to conclusions about what is, you know, a sort of inviolable territorial claim to yeah. something. Do you ever feel yourself <laughs> in the projection business? Do you ever find your? Do you ever, as a hobby, get into the 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 business of futurism, thinking, well, you know, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, and so I think that this may happen or this may happen. Do you ever find yourself thinking those ways? I don't tend to, be, uh, simply because there's so much uh, that keeps me occupied in in with, in the study of the past. But you know, when certain things do happen. Uh, and I, I bumped up against some kind of historical precedent in that region. I do think about the fact that, that uh, yeah, well, it wasn't always this way, or well, actually, you know, such and such happened, and before it could happen again. Yeah. Um, and when people make justifications for, for certain things, you know, I think, mm, yeah, well, it wasn't always that way, or I've heard that before, you know, I, yeah. like that. But I don't, I don't project in the sense that I think that you're thinking of. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you one quick question, then I want yep. to do the quick Q&A. Yep. Um, what are, if you were to put together sort of a Mount Rushmore of dream, dream excavations? What would oh, be on that you know, I don't, I don't think like that. I, okay. you know, I... There, there are people who are very keen on the sort of high profile sites, meaning sites that probably were capitals of, of ancient states or empires. Um, and of course, you're, you're going to find important things there. But I, I've always been drawn to the lesser known. Um, if something is really well known, I probably don't want to work on it. I, I like the feeling of explaining things or finding out about something that was really unknown. Mm -hmm. And so that's te that tends to be more in marginal areas that have been ignored by the mainstream um, over time. Yeah. And, you know, and of course, that's where amazing surprises can come. So it's it for me, you know, you just don't know where something amazing is going to uh, turn up. And 
filling in those gaps in our understanding is interesting. At the moment, I'm doing a project in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan with a colleague in Munich, Karen Rodner. And this is an area that we know the Assyrians conquered in the ninth century BC. Um, but it's kind of, it's east of the main Assyrian capitals. Uh, it's west of some of the better known sites in, in Iran. And it's just a sort of blank on the map. And that that is attractive to me. Yeah. So, you know, my, my Mount Rushmore is more about taking a, a really blank kind of mountain face and chipping away at it and seeing if there isn't something really terrific uh, behind yeah. the blank facade. If there's Abraham Lincoln is on, underneath <laughs> that mountain somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do this rapid fire Q&A and then we have a question yeah. in the audience. Okay, so what are you reading or watching these days? <laughs> uh, well, I what I'm watching is is entirely, you know, sort of no judgment, no judgment Sorry? at all, and no judgment no, at no, all. No, I'm I'm watching a, a French series uh, of, of murder mysteries uh, that's called in English "Murder In," mm -hmm. uh, because every single episode is filmed in a different city or region in France. So you see some amazing. Uh, areas, amazing scenery and places amazing. that I've never visited. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. And they're very good and very okay. you know, complicated. Um, what I'm reading, actually, at the moment, I'm not reading anything particularly uh, uh, sort of deep and meaningful. I've been reading with my wife uh, a book by the 19th century um, mystery writer Wilkie Collins, uh, who is known for things like the Moonstone and the Woman in White, um, which are good, but he also wrote a whole load of other uh, mysteries that are not very well known. And these are incredibly entertaining, but it's again, pure escapism. Okay, cool. Of course, I'm reading a ton of academic things all the time, but uh, yeah. those are great. Okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let's keep going. Who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Oh, that is, that is not so easy. Uh, but um, I mean, I, you see, one, one thing about me is that I don't have huge, I mean, I have respect for certain people, Abraham Lincoln, you know, sure. uh, but I don't, when I look at the, the past that I study, although, uh, you know, there are endless numbers of, of, of kings and queens uh, and important people. I don't, I don't study them because I admire them. I study them because they're there in that period that I'm working on and they're a, a part of the history of that period. So I don't tend to have any kind of great favorites in that regard. Sure. Um, so I might take somebody like Abraham Lincoln. I'd go with yeah. that. Yeah, I mean... Um... There is uh, that first millionaire sounds like an yes. interesting person to spend a little yeah, time with. That's true. <laughs> um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Oh, I think, you know, I mean, if, if I, you know, being an academic, like, I'm not a sort of, superstar right i but of course if i publish a book it gets reviewed you know and a, a, a bit like actors you know who say i never read reviews uh, because it's it's usually you know difficult um but if i if i think of some of the things that have been said in reviews uh, i i suppose there's a kind of um there's a feeling that in the 21st century, that unless you're theoretical in a way, uh, in an explicit way, your work is just sort of pedestrian. Mm. And I would say that there's an awful lot of, um, I think you can, you, you have to do a lot of pedestrian work in order to put together such a mass of data that I, I'm always dealing with. And a lot of that is just, 
very hard slog and sorting things out. There's nothing much theoretical about that, but it, it's not something that everybody can do either because it, it, you tend to be dealing with many, many, I mean, hundreds and thousands of pieces of information and organizing it in such a way that it becomes meaningful is not something everybody can do. So I'd say that's something that I think maybe is underappreciated. Interesting, very, very interesting. Um, okay, last one is outside of your profession, whose work are you inspired by? Um, I mean, how far outside my profession are you? Miles Davis. Uh, oh yeah. Charlie okay. Chaplin. Well, yeah. I mean, there there are. Uh, yeah, there there are. Look, if I have to give one name, sure, and I'll just leave it at one name, is Johann Sebastian Bach, without any question. Uh, uh, it's there's just nothing. I don't think people who aren't interested in um, Baroque music can really appreciate uh, the thousands of compositions he wrote and the absurd quality. You hear one and you think, oh my God, if I could write that one thing, the yeah. one aria in that one oratorio or mass. I, I could die a happy person. He was writing these weekly, right? Yeah. He, he was a genius. And obviously people like Mozart, Beethoven too. Are you, are you? But Bach is my, my full-time favorite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it the prolific nature of his work? No, or no, the, no. The, the quality. The, the, the quality, intricate genius. The and... genius of, I mean, he, he wrote such beautiful and memorable music that, you know, and so much of it. It's just, I don't, I don't think it's easy to find a comparison. Um, and it's a, just, you know, a brain that I don't think we know enough about the brain to really be able to fully appreciate. But just to give one example, his son was also one of his son, yeah. uh, many of his sons were musicians, but one of his sons was the court composer for Frederick the Great. And by the time he was working for Frederick the Great, the Bach himself was pretty old. And he went one time to visit his son. And Frederick the Great was an amateur musician and wrote some music. And he played for Bach a, a, a melody that he'd written on, uh, on for the flute, I believe. And Bach sat down and improvised an eight part variation on that theme. So, you know, we, we think of two dimension, three dimension, four dimension, but this is like eight dimensions. Yeah. I don't think we can un, uh, imagine what kind of a brain is cap has that capability. Yeah. Anyway, so easily I admire massively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We have one question. We have two questions in the audience. I want to um, ask both of them just to save time. And I'll ask you both of them at the same time. So one comes from Stephen. Dear Dan, if you had one last book to write, what would it be about? And then the second question is um, humans are using technology to learn how to improve tomorrow's life and uh, ignoring history, do you agree with that sort of diagnosis or not? Yeah, well, starting with that last one, I, I think I do, because I think the kind of people who are developing, you know, artificial intelligence and, and working in Silicon Valley and wherever are not particularly uh, appreciative of early human history. I mean, I might be doing them a big disservice, I hope I am. I hope they're more aware of, of human history than I, than I know. That would be very nice to think. Um, <clears throat> as far as having one last book, I, you know, it, it's, uh, I just enjoy research. And um, I'm, I, I'm not a good car mechanic. I'm not good at a lot of things, but I just really enjoy research and I'm, uh, 
and so I feel a little bit like a like a, somebody with a gambling addiction. You know, if I can't work on this, I'll work on that. You know, and and I I get really before I finish one thing, I'm already kind of on to the next because of some little bit that I may have discovered in the course of writing an article or in the, in the preparation of something. And that sets me off in another direction. Yeah. And I have to say that the, that the, you know, going back to our discussion about uh, the later periods, let's say medieval through early modern periods in, in Arabia and Iran, um, the, the older I've gotten, the more I've gotten interested in those periods. Um, because, as I said, I like to kind of go from the early period that I'm working on and then travel forward and follow the arc of, of history. So, for example, in this book, The Archaeology of Elam, it went from really early times right up to the Islamic conquest. Um, whereas, you know, other, other people would say, no, 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 I, I work on the Bronze Age. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I am interested in the region, and the more I've worked in the region, the more I find the later historical periods every bit as interesting as my, my original sort of archaeological periods that were much older. Um, so I don't know what my, what my what last book might be, but I kind of think it might be more history than archaeology, if only for the fact that I find the complexity of history challenging and entertaining because there's so much more data um, and so many more interconnections that we can see. We can speculate a lot in the, in the more remote past, but when you're getting up into like the 17th, 18th, 19th century, there's a whole lot going on uh, that I just find fascinating, but within that same area. And I would say to any archeologists, especially students, it's extremely helpful to have a knowledge of the later historical periods for the area that you're most interested in, because you come up upon all kinds of geographical, economic, political, religious issues that absolutely resonate with the earlier periods and give you a better understanding, I think. So for me, these dividing lines of time are very uh, unhelpful. I, I like to look at the full sweep uh, in an area. Amazing. Well, Dan, we've run out of time. Um, thank you so much for making the time to talk with us. You're uh, very welcome. And for, uh, for broad brushing through 3,000 years as, <laughs> with ease. <laughs> um, this conversation will go up on our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow and up on our podcast. If you know anyone who missed it and would like to watch it, please feel free to share uh, widely and subscribe and all that good stuff. Dan, thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Mickey. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.